Hello and welcome to the Interpreting Wine Hospitality Podcast with me, your host and podcast founder, Lawrence Francis. Welcoming you to this series celebrating the category of sherry. Released during Sherry Week 2019, this series will transport you to the region via conversations with Senor Beltran Domecq of the Consejo Regulador and winemakers and owners of several bodega houses in the region. Sharing this information in podcast format, a first for the region, these nine episodes will bust some myths about sherry that still exist in the marketplace and educate and attract a whole new audience of sherry drinker. So without further ado, here's today's episode of the series. Today's episode of the Sherry Week Special features a guided tour of Bodegas Tradición. Eduardo Davis, Export Manager for Bodegas Tradición, takes us first into the archive and uncovers some of the history of the site and the region before walking us through the evolution of a Fino Sherry and its passes through into being an Amontillado. This is an excellent episode if you've ever wondered exactly how a Sherry is aged, how it's fortified, and indeed how it's marketed overseas. Enjoy! Tradición is the 11th generation uh, related to sherry in the Rivero family. Um, first, there were eight generations as J.M. Rivero C. said. Okay, the C. said coming from the very origin of the family um, as Cabeza de Aranda y Zarco. Okay, I will explain that later if you want. Um, that first project was lost after eight generations. Uh, when when part of the of the shareholders sold to a big olive oil group in seventy eight, and then in ninety something or eighty three actually, um, well they bankrupt the company. Um, the family, this branch of the family, stayed at the bodega, tried to keep up with everything that this big group did, um, but they couldn't avoid bankruptcy. Um, so the generation that was going to take over that one is actually the one that founded Bodega Tradición 20 years ago. So Mr. Joaquin Rivero uh, wanted to start again, you know, and, 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 and it was a promise to his father um, that he would uh, start a bodega for the generations to come. Um, so they had to start with a different name, with Tradición, because uh, the brands were owned by some bank mm. or whatever. Mm. Mm. And, um, and yet, yeah, the only thing they could trace and, and buy back was the most important thing, which is the history. This is the biggest and oldest archive related to Sherry that exists. And the big importance on it is that is previous the industrialization of sherry. It was it's 150 years older than the moment the British and the French came here. So you can see many things that you don't see in other archives. Um, like for example, where did people store the wines before having this kind of buildings? So they, they used convents. Um, to store the wines, and they would pay a rent or mm. to mm. for the space, and then the the monastery would have a kind of right to to drink some of the wines. Mm -hmm. uh, we have papers telling you about that. But there is a lot of the industry uh, of, of the commerce and the production, the viticulture. Uh, for example, we know now exactly the moment where. Alvariza started to be uh, subdivided in 1740-something. So that's 50 years before Burgundy starts to parcel. Mm -hmm. um, and we have, well, that classification is in one of those books. And I think it's something around 12 or 14 kind of Alvarizas that they were already detecting and so planting different kinds of, of of vines in one or, or the other, 
or doing some kind of labor in one vineyard and not in the other. Okay, uh, but you have also little pieces of history. Uh, of course, all the letters, well, a letter would take around six months to have an answer. Um, so letters were telling about the business, but also telling stories of the everyday, about the war, mm. etc. Um, and, well, you find little pieces of history like this one. Um, in 1905, through a club in London, um, related to the Naval, um, naval uh, Club or Association, um, a member of this family, the president then of J.M. Rivero, uh, received two presents. Um, these two presents were trying to say, well, celebrating a bit Trafalgar, uh, but also saying sorry because the Riveros had sent this vessel full of wine mm. and it was oppressed by Nelson's ar army. They, supposedly they, they, they drank a little to celebrate victory, and then the rest they sold to, to this merchant in Tarifa. Uh, the family had to buy it back to make sure that the order was served to the clients. Um, so it was a big hassle for the family. Um, so 100 years later, they received, as you can read here, mm. a portion of the sale from Admiral Nelson flagship, Victory, uh, which was in the Battle of Trafalgar, 1805. Um, I don't know what it says here. Senor... Senato? No. Uh, no. Senor Don... Whatever. Senor Don Joaquin Maria Rivero, CVO, commander of the... Uh, was uh, C CVO or CRO? He's a commander for some kind of title. Mm -hmm. um, on his visit to Mr. Whatever Taylor at the Sandust Club, 9 Wood Street, London. That is yeah. one piece of history. Then when we think about, for example, well, this is from the representative of the Duke of Gloucester, mm -hmm. the Duke of Gloucester, um, asking for wine from J.M. Rivero in 1771. So it was, Rivero was, um, how do you say, purveyor or supplier to the, yeah, to the crown, uh, not only the British one, but Portuguese, Spanish, Danish, um, yeah. And then, I, I don't know, we, try, we, we tend to think about China being a new market for wine, but there you have the proof, mm. or part one of the proofs, that the family was sending wines to China already in 1767. Wow. Uh, you may read around here. Um, so he's mm -hmm. so a client saying, I know how busy you are preparing the wines for the vessels that go to China. So yeah, it's quite... Yeah, this is the, the title I was talking about. Um, Commander of the Royal Victorian Order, yeah. So they, they were very, they had relations with, with, with Britain for, I don't know, 300 years or so, being suppliers of the, of, the, of the crown and having not only the wine business but many other businesses uh, with, with London. Uh, actually, one of the, of the Riveros had part of his tes testament deposit in, in a firm in London, and this is, this is it. Uh, this is all the posh side, if you want. So this is the notebook for the guy keeping the vineyard. Okay? The family would teach or help them um, be able to write uh, in, in, some, in some occasions. So everything that he did... Um, uh, all the orders, the different labors, how much it was paid mm. to which person. When it was done, then he would cross it. This is um, 1768. In 1768, here in Spain, it might have been 
one, two percent of the people would know how to read and write back then. So everything would be written down, even the the hard bread that he would buy for for the for the dogs and the hens and so on. Everything. It was yeah. little <laughs> sense of well. Uh, Manuel has gone through so much information that maybe he has seen around five different currencies in in the time he has. Wow. Now the problem is no one alive knows the content of the of yeah. the archive. So all these are letters. Here's are uh, the copies of the letters. So whatever um, we had to send a, a letter, it, it had to be copied here. So when we received the answer, we knew what it was talking about. Um, but all this is very difficult to know what there, what, what there is. In six years, it has only seen 30%. But of course, it has to um, clean, repair. Uh, you know, if, if there is something broken, it needs to cut around it so that, that it doesn't break anymore. Um, uh, and then read and, and classify uh, what he's reading. The idea of this archive, of course, is to share it. Um, to share it with, with, to give some value. Uh, mm -hmm. So it would be digitalized um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so that researchers, students, and so on can come into this archive online and, and find the documents. Because, you know, um, for, for, for Jerez, um, viticulture, um, commerce, and, uh. and history, this is huge. This is very important. So we want to open the doors of the archive somehow. And the only way to do it, of course, is through the internet. So we are working on that. Of course, we need a scanner that doesn't, um, doesn't uh, do any harm to the papers. And, uh, well, and, and people also. We need, we need st students to come. We're working with, with the university to start a collaboration. So... Hopefully soon, we'll see people here working hard, yeah. on top of Manuel, of course. <laughs> well, we, we've seen here in the, in the house um, that mm, some of the clients asked for unfortified wines. Um, take into account that fortification is a way of stabilizing wines. Mm. Um, the other way of stabilizing wines is first um, gaining um, a, a natural degree and secondly um, aging so the alcohol concentrates. Uh, when, when a wine was fortified, uh, normally it would mean rather it was picked from plants given too much volume so the natural degree was low uh, or that it was very young wine and it didn't have the time to, to concentrate. Um, and this is something that we are seeing and we are changing in, in, in the ways we treat our soleras. Because we age wines 25, 30, 40 years, we don't need to fortify so much. Mm -hmm. um, uh, mm -hmm. If we fortify, uh, let's say, from the, well, I can explain it later, mm -hmm. from Fino to Amontillado, if, if we fortify to 18 degrees, when, it's, when, when we are jumping from Fino to Amontillado, that, um, that Fino Amontillado will need another 30 years for us to be finished. So if we fortify the beginning at 18, after 30 years of concentration, that would be 23, 24 degrees, which is not even considered wine anymore. Mm -hmm. And that's why we don't, we don't fortify in that bridge from Fino to Amontillado. We do a much natural past that we will see later. All right. Manuel, Amazing. Amazing. muchísimas gracias. So now that you, you know how important history is for the family, I think the most valuable side of this archive is, well, the, the effort that a family puts in preserving it's history, because most of times this this would this kind of archives would be lost in time. Mm -hmm. But the Rivero family kept on teaching the next generation to know how important that is to preserve what they receive, 
and to work every day to produce more history, you know, and, and that is what for me personally means most. Um, they could have bought cheap paper um, and cheap ink, but mm -hmm. they didn't. They, they invested in very good quality paper and very good ink so that that lasted forever. And, and now we are the, that generation that also keeping very important those documents yeah. that are more important to, for the next generations to understand what we did during our time. You know? So, yeah, if you take your glasses, because the idea now is to, to show you the evolution of Palomino, um, the importance of aging, and the importance of the continuous classification of the wines. So I'm, I'm going to show you the, the Palomino from Sobre Tabla 2018, so the last vintage, almost no aging. It's been only three weeks in the cask. Um, here. Um, to an Amontillado of 42 years, if that's okay. So, as we said, well, this is the third annex to um, Bodegas Tradición. Uh, 20 years ago, we started with Cordobeses number three, which is 17th century bodega. Uh, we started to fill up um, with, with old wines. So basically, we started the other way around. Mm. Um, first set up the Solera, the first Criadera, the second Criadera, and then little by little in these 20 years, we've been getting closer to the vineyard. Uh, the idea is, of course, to have a vineyard one day uh, and have an integrated production. Okay, but um, in that aim of controlling the whole process, we needed more space. So first Cordobeses number three, and the annex Cordobeses number five, uh, some years later. And then six years back, Rincón Malillo, which is the name of this bodega, uh, only for very, old, very young wines, mm. Olorosos and Finos. Okay. Uh, I do have a question there. I mean, how do you, like, you know, the process that you've said there, you know, in, in essentially in, you know, relatively technical terms, I mean, mm. how, how do you explain that to somebody that maybe is not an expert in, yeah. in, in sherry and so, is just interested in wine? So what, what Mr. Joaquin Rivero mm. did 20 years ago is find the place to set up the bodega, empty, Okay, uh, a bodega with no wine in it, with no casks in it. And he surrounded himself with experts to select wines and casks from different growers. Um, uh, bodegas, uh, almacenistas, who are people that age the wines and sell them bulk. Um, and um, yeah, and even some private bodegas. Um, and those wines were all put together um, to to find their own style or our own style. What Mr. Joaquin wanted was to show what it used to be the family reserve in every bodega, so locked uh, um, behind a, a gate and only shown to very, very important people and things like that, that he wanted to, to show to the public because he believed that what made Jerez famous were the very, aged, very long aged uh, wines and famous like 17th and 18th century, not mm. like mm. popular like the 60s and 70s mm. of, mm. of the 20th. Um, so that's how it, he did it, very little by little, um, and making sure that every wine that came in was perfect for what he was um, uh, looking for. All that power, all that complexity, all that concentration of time with a very clean, fresh mode so that when you drink it, it doesn't tire you, mm -hmm. and, and, you and, it's yeah. like, and you're asking for more. Yeah. That's, that's yeah. the idea. Um, Jerez, vino de Jerez, as we conceive it here in Jerez. Um, th that kind of wine that you only buy if you are giving it to someone as a present. Mm -hmm. uh, or if you have it at home, you only drink it in the, in, during the weekend, uh, just yeah. a small glass. That's, yeah. that's the idea, okay? And of course, today, for high-end gastronomy, uh, for independent merchants, that's our that's our clientele. Mm -hmm. Okay. Good. Now we'll be in. 
So if you come here, we can choose from one of these barrels marked ST 2018, which means Sobre Tablas 2018. Sobre Tablas means on top of the board. So this wine came to an empty barrel. Okay? Um, this is the selection we do for potential finos. It comes from very fresh vineyards, very westerly oriented, um, with normally higher in, in the hill, let's say 40, 50 meters, so that mm. the, the, the route needs to be very long to go to the water reserve. And it, so it's given loads of different um, components to the wine. Uh, more, uh, if you want, complexity. I don't like the word, but more structure, if you want, more, more character at the end of the day. So what we did is fermented as a white wine um, with natural yeast, okay, respecting that. Um, and then when it's around 12 degrees of alcohol, fortified up to 15.3, okay, between 15 and 15.50 so that we can have a very healthy floor, okay? The floor is this uh, layer that you can see here. It's a layer of, of the same yeast that fermented the wine. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, wow. it, smell. it smells, it's now producing a lot of acetaldehyde, which reminds us of and a Granny Smith, when you put it in the oven, when it starts to, to heat up, that, that first sensation. A little bit like green almonds also. Mm -hmm. um, and something else that makes your nose a bit itchy. Mm -hmm. you know? Actually, though, I mean, one thing that hearing you speak there and hearing the... Actually, I'm going to use the, that other the, cask. The different, um, you know, attention to detail, really. Mm -hmm. Something no one has really spoken about has been what alcohol they use to, to do the fortification. Oh, of course. What, what, is, we, what is going on there? We give, we give that as known. Um, it needs to be um, a wine spirit. Okay? Um, it is actually, it's actually um, from the most neutral grape you can find, which is vineyards of Airen planted exclusively for um, distillation. Okay. And Airen planted in Jerez? No, 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 no. Airen uh, coming from normally from La Mancha mm. or um, Alicante area, mm. which they are much more productive. Mm -hmm. um, and we need an alcohol which is 96.5. And, 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 and it needs to, to have no traces of, of any grape character or anything. Actually, the fermentation of that grape is done so with neutral, neutral um, yeasts so that there is no secondary aromas in the alcohol neither. So basically, once the wine is fortified and you have time to put wine and alcohol together, the result is as good as having a, um, a, a natural degree, actually sometimes even better, because we are extracting aromas here that with natural degree are covered with the fruit character. Okay, so yeah. it's two yeah. different yeah. kind of yeah. wines. I, I, I love wines of Asoleo or, 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 or wines that have natural degree um, in the plant or just before fermentation. But they are different and for different moments. Um, this is not a competition between fortified or un unfortified. Uh, it needs to be complementary. Um, and each wine has a different moment to be drunk. How is this? So this is got in here how long ago? This, is this has been in the cask for three weeks now. Most of it is coming away. from Balbaina. Mm -hmm. Okay, Balbaina is in Jerez, in the road from Jerez to Sanlúcar, the big road on the left side, most of it.
Okay, so we are looking for elegance. It here. will be 15, 15 degrees, you said. Yeah, 15.3, actually. That one is still not um, reproducing the floor. That, this is why I gave, the, gave you this one. Okay. Same wine okay. with floor. Okay. The same wine with floor. And see if you have any, if you see the differences. You might find a little bit of sulfur Maybe. in it. Yeah. Uh, and it's because the wines are stabilized mm. uh, with sulfur to be transported here to the bodega. Although mm. it's 25 minute drive from the plant to here, mm. but you need a little bit of sulfur to, to mm. stabilize it and make sure you don't have problems. So again, the difference was this is now. Really this is cool. this has been this the the floor is already created on top. And that one is in term in starting to to create it. So for the for the sobre tabla for the vintage wine that mm -hmm. goes for fino, this is the preschool, or is like the 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 last exam before going to fino. Mm -hmm. um, it's going to take some of these casks six months, some of them one year, and some will not make the cut. After a year and a half, we will see that they are not good for Fino. We might send them, depending on the cask, might send them to potential Palo Cortados or Oloroso or whatever. It might have had no floor at all, so it could be an Oloroso. It might have a little bit of floor metabolizing, very little the wine. It could be a potential Palo Cortado. It's only time who's going to tell us. Okay. And I feel like, given the attention to detail, mm -hmm. this, you are the right person to ask about floor, you know, and what, what you understand about floor in 2019. Well, floor has been with us thousands of years. Mm. Um, we have been talking about it for 50, 60 years. It's been so many researchers around it. Um, how we understand it in Tradición... Um, we set up a solera of fino, a soleraje of fino, a system of aging fino, because we needed old finos to maintain our amontillados. That was the beginning. Now we have a soleraje de fino with two purposes. One, bottling a 10-year-old fino. The other one, having a 10-year-old fino that is asking to be an amontillado. So we see, um, we, we, we focus on the floor very, very strictly. Um, because different kind of floor is going to give you different kinds of fino. Mm -hmm. um, and we can see the evolution of floor in age also. Um, floor has four kinds of yeast minimum um, that are componing the, the colony. Um, some of them are stronger when the wines are young. Mm -hmm. Some of, of them are stronger when the youngs are getting old. Um, sometimes th there's only one type when, when a wine is very, very old. Okay, we will see that later. Um, but at the end, it makes you treat each cask as a little baby. Uh, and it really is something that we are looking at m every week, uh, sometimes a couple of times per week, when we, when we see things that are happening that shouldn't be happening, or or the other way. We are very happy when the springtime comes and we see the floor coming up and, and all, the, all the aromas that, that you can get out of it. Um, yeah, it's, it's good. It was even, back in time, it was even used for, for belly problems for, for the kids when they were not mm, hungry and uh, they would give them a piece of bread with, with some sweet wine and a little bit of floor on top. Mm -hmm. Of course, kids around bodegas. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But there was also a time where kids would ask for tar tar tartaric to eat because there was nothing to eat and the tartaric w was given salt, minerals, and, and some, su some sugars also. So Jerez has a lot of history mm -hmm. around, mm -hmm. around the sub-produce sub of... Yeah. Now our re there are restaurants asking us to give them floor to be able to cook with floor. But we're, we're too small to do that. Yeah.
I mean, and, and you know, to kind of continue the theme, I mean, have you looked or are you in contact? Is it interesting, like other regions of the wine world where they use floor? Yeah, of course they are. As Jura you, and Hungary are too. There, there, is, there, is quite, there is quite a... Um, an exchange of, of information, particularly in, um, uh, in u universities. I cannot tell you much about it because I'm not a, a winemaker myself. Um, but I know from our winemaker that he has received visits of French uh, only wanting to see the floor and to take um, and to take and analyze the floor, etc. Mm -hmm. Tradition has a little bit of innovation also, and what we've done here is reproduce the climate that you have by the river in San Lucar or by the river in El Puerto, where finos naturally have the right amount of humidity and, and freshness. Mm. But of course, when the air is not moving, like now, it, it is a bit like, it seems a bit like a sauna. But we are actually at 24 degrees, which is good for the floor. Mm -hmm. Only 75% humidity. So that's what we are noticing. How focused are you on maintaining those conditions? No, we have, we have sensors mm. uh, in, spread throughout the whole, the whole bodega. Um, sensors that are on top, between and in the casks uh, to monitor temperatures in, in the wine and outside on the walls of the casks, etc. We have sensors on a few columns um, and then there is a guy that receives all this information in, in his computer and automatically sends it to the, to the winemaker, etc. Mm -hmm. And whenever there is uh, humidity going below 60% or uh, temperature going higher than 26 or lower than uh, 16, he receives an, an alarm and, and he mm. can do something about it. So. But, that, but that's the same then, kind of uh, in concreto, but it, like specifically, you know the ideal conditions for the floor. Of course, develop. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you're very clear on. Well, what that's they are. that's that's uh, part of the human part of the terroir. We we've been doing wine here for four thousand eight hundred years, mm. um, and we know that floor needs alcohol to live. It needs air. It needs uh, temperature to be around the twenties. Um, um, and humidity to be between 70 and 80 percent or 85 percent. Uh, so that's known f mm. for mm. sure, mm. I mean, mm. by many researchers. Um, so, yeah. This Do is. Do something, intervene. You know. Like a grape is a living thing because things happen inside. The wine is living also, mm. and it needs. Mm. So, it needs to be preserved as a, I don't know. If you, if you bring a tomato home, you know you have to put it in a certain place of the, of the fridge where mm. the humidity is low and the, and the temperature is 5.2, yeah. for example. You know? yeah, yeah. Okay. So this is Cuarta Criadera, fourth Criadera. And this, this one has passed that test of sobre tablas and is confirmed to be a good wine for Fino. So it's starting here, he's already finding his older brothers of 2017, 2016, 2015, a mix of all of them, and it's a wine around two years already, okay? We see already how the floor development, the metabolism of the floor has done thanks to the wine, starting to dry it off, um, starting to give those nutty al mm. almond, toasted almond mm. side a little bit of hay mm. and concentrating the, the, the soil side, that chalky side. So we were going to jump a little bit. We will jump third Criadera and take a look at 
Second criadera. Segunda criadera. Um, this is already around the five and a half, six years old. It's very important to know that we don't do any treatment to the wine, okay? Since we receive it, there's no treatment at all. For us, the way to stabilize wine is through time. We believe that nature makes that grow. So if it doesn't go away, it's because we've done things properly. Of course, the, the alcohol level is correct for the floor to work. Um, the floor is going to feed on the alcohol level, so mm. we need to keep an eye on that. Um, then oxidation is not only because of the rackings, but also through the floor there is a little bit of metabolic uh, oxidation. So the wine gets to, to this golden color. Um, um, naturally, it's a pale golden color if you want, um, but it starts to see some well, the brightness that has got that, that, that reflections that you see, um, what we call rompe copas. So it's almost breaking the glass yeah. of, of bright. You know? And it's a wine that is, at this stage, um, it would be um, an amazing aperitif wine. But here in Tradición, we don't want to produce wines that are just to drink without thinking what you're, what you're doing. Um, so instead of this five and a half, six years, we're going to go ten year, uh, to 10 years. Okay, this is the middle of the aging mm -hmm. of, the, mm -hmm. of the wine. In the nose, you, you find, well, what people call the floor character. Now is the maximum expression of aging of a fino which for us is a bit of, of a shame. We want to see the, the wine behind this. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So this is why also we go on a little bit more. So this acetaldehyde integrates in the wine and lets the wine talk. That's, that's what we're going to see. Later. And, and I think one uh, important point for me, and maybe people that you know, want to understand the category more, is, is that idea of... You know, you're not intervening. You're letting the cask speak to you. Exactly. exactly. I mean, what, what are the the options that are available to you that you're perhaps not taking? You know, in terms of stabilization, and, and what well, happens to the wine where maybe well, it's not making the grade? Once they've once they have passed that first exam of sobre tablat, which, which is for the wine, the first touch of wood that is going to mm -hmm. find. Um, if the wine gets well with the wood and, and, and the floor develops well, then we just keep on looking at each cask. Each cask has, is like a house. and It's like a little school, if you want. So each mm -hmm. cask has a determined character. We know each cask. We know the history of each cask. And so we know the tendency of the wines that are going to be in these casks. What we do is maximize those potentials. Um, so those wines that we want for Fino, for the bottle, to be a bit more pungent, a bit more uh, fresh, if you want, those are marked in each stage of aging. So we take those wines and put them in the same kind of cask in the, ne in the next stage of aging. So we are you know, respecting the natural tendency of that wine through the cask selection. The other ones, are a bit more rustic if you want. They have toasted notes that are not a good note for a Fino, um, but they are amazing for Amontillado. So we will do the same. We will test, taste those casks, mark them, and when we need to move on to the next level of aging, we will go to the same type of cask. That way in Solera, we're going to find two different kind of wines. Um, it's just about observing and being lucky of having a capataz or cellar master that is over 50 years of experience in Jerez and a um, winemaker that is third generation winemaker in Jerez. So that's, mm. that's for us a big, big point. And maybe quickly, 
of course, it leads to other, other questions, but like, ha, like continually now, how easy is it to find Los Capataces, the cellar masters, to, that know and feel this? At well, the, 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 there still are some Capataces, old school Capataces, but most of them are in retiring, retiring uh, age. Uh, but you know, the sagas continue. Some, some of them have the next generation or even two working in bodegas already. So in, in our case, um, our cellar master or capataz uh, son, one of his um, sons, is here also working. And he's been here for 15 years. And, and the son of, of, of this son is working in another bodega just 10 minutes walk. And maybe one day, he will come here, maybe. We, we, we don't know. But that's, that's a saga thing. Uh, mm, and I mm. think it's something you need to learn from very young. Uh, and, and it's not only the, the nose and the experience of the nose, but it's also been very methodic. Uh, only lining up the casks like this by hand. Only making this. This is a piece of art. You know, being able to put the cask exactly like this, only with your hands and with few, a few wooden tools, is amazing. So that's learned from father to son. You know? mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Let's go and see the Amontillado. Well, that's what we bottle as Fino Tradición. So it's a 10 year old wine, okay? What I was explaining. We do a very natural jump from Fino to, Amon to Amontillado. You see, here we are at the sixth criadera of Amontillado, and it has a little bit of floor. Well, a little, quite, quite a good amount of floor. And all, all of the sexta criadera is now in springtime has floor, because we are at 16.4 degrees of alcohol only. If we, if we did like others do, that want oxidation to come very quickly, fortify up to 18 degrees and you get rid of it but we have time you know mm -hmm. so we don't need mm -hmm. to push mm -hmm. what do you what do you call this process then Ve when, you, when you pour in venenciar i'm sorry venenciar venenciar yeah i knew there'd be a there'd be a verb this is called a, sorry this is called the venencia can you cut that on the video okay. <laughs> <laughs> this is called the venencia mm. okay uh, I'll give you some wine. So, Amontillado, well, the beginning, well, the beginning of Amontillado is there. Actually, our Amontillado system has 12 scales. Five criaderas and one solera there, as, as a fino, and then five criaderas and one solera here as an Amontillado. Okay? So this has been aging under the floor, at least 10 years, and then has another three, four years of ex oxidation. This is 18, 18%, more or less. You start to see what, what it will become one of the uh, main characters of our Amontillado. Um, it's only the beginning. Now I will show you when it's the main thing. So fourth credera, we can say, is 100% the work of this generation. Tradición, well, not just this generation, the first generation of tradición, 20 years. Okay. From, um, from, sorry, from third credera, we have wines that we bought, okay, mm. already mm. aged, mm. all right? From Amartenices. From everywhere around. More or less, in all this time, more or less there have been 30 so, 40 different suppliers. Yeah. We are confirming that we are doing our, our job well, because that fourth criadera Amontillado is perfectly connecting to the style of Amontillado we have in the third, second, first, and solera. So things are done well. I mean, it takes a long time. Um, to really understand the VOS and VORS system. If we want to keep, as in our case, a 42-year-old Amontillado, if we want to bottle one year 1,000 liters, 
we need to have 42,000 liters of that mm -hmm. same wine. Because plus you can only take out 1%. That allocation. So, and the proportional young wines to keep it, as, as I mentioned, for this Amontillado, we have six criaderas here. The soleras, so are seven scales, mm -hmm. plus another six scales. That's 13 scales to make one wine. It's a lot of wine. It's a lot of time. Yeah. And a lot of, of time, yeah. And, and in your travels and research, I mean, have you come across anything like that in the world of wine, you know, where, where it's, it takes so long to be no, self-sustaining, where it takes so long to be in I haven't, of your I haven't really, I haven't really. I have uh, seen private sellers that have a little bit of that, where the father would tell, well, would receive from the grandfather um, a certain collection of, of wines, some to drink, some to guard for the next generation, mm. and teach the next generation to drink some, guard some for the next generation, and buy new ones also for the, new, the next generations. But, um, but then if you want certain, well, I would say, certain non-vintage cognacs if you want, but in much smaller scale. And, and they sell much, much more expensive than, than a wine from ours. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So Amontillado Tradición Vors, this is what we, we bottle. We bottle only 4,500 bottles per year. And we have, in this soleraje, we have around 60, 70,000 liters minimum. This is around 2%. 4,000 bottles at five, uh, half, half a liter? No, 75. So that's around 3,000 liters. Yeah. So 2% two, two what we are bottling, mm. more or less. 2% of the total. Can you bottle more? Or we, could that, bot we could bottle a, a bit more. But, that's but then about the instead of 42 years, it would be kept at... 30 or so. What we want is so this to stay at 42 years. a sustainable years. level. Exactly. Yeah. So that the next generation that comes yeah. understands yeah. Yeah. that you have to be, you, know, yeah. you have to have a margin. Yeah. A, yeah. a yeah. big margin. You can't just think in yourself and your yeah. own generation. Exactly. Yeah. So yeah. there you go. Here you have wines that go back to 1902. So the oldest wine that came here was uh, from a solera founded in 1902, which is around the Phylloxera time here in Jerez. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The, the, first, uh, n the first notice of um, Phylloxera was 1897 here in Jerez, very much later than, than in France. So, yeah, there are four or five generations work in that way. I've got, I've got to ask you something, which yep. I've not asked anybody else, really, is, is the why, you know, n n not necessarily just here, but more broadly. You know, we, we keep hearing that earth is, is as complexity, it, it's, it, but that, that almost always comes with being undervalued, you mm -hmm. know, people not paying enough. For, for what they're getting. So why do not, people, why not do people case. still keep going? This, okay, tell me. This is, this is not our case because mm -hmm. we've, we've always known that the, the right price is what it is mm. and we are not unsetting the one or we're not down, mm. down, downing the, the prices. Actually, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. we have two of our wines already s sold campaign after campaign, so even three or four months before we have the new campaign, we are out of stock of two of the six wines. Um, Where in the world? No, no, here. Like, we Just don't have any Pere. more to sell. No, no, there is no more stock to sell mm. because we, we cannot bottle more. But we you know mean it's, it's, it's sold in, in which markets? Sold out, well, in 25 markets, mm. 20 to 25, but mainly in Spain. I think it's 55% mm. 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 in Spain. 
we have um, we have done a lot of efforts in in teaching, uh, promoting, uh, bringing people. I think it's over 500 sommeliers and Amazing. and cooks that have come to yeah. Bodegas Tradición. Yeah. So, yeah, it's it's just you know you have to communicate yeah. if you have something yeah. different, yeah. and I can tell you. In Spain and out of mm -hmm. Spain, when mm -hmm. you show this kind of wines from Tradición, mm -hmm. people say, wow, this is not the sherry yeah. that my, my granny used to drink. No. This is no <laughs> sherry I've ever tasted, no. nothing like this. So, yeah, they need to be shown. And, and this is why we have, we are four of us, uh, out of 12 people, four, uh, traveling all the time. To, to show the people the sherry. Thank you so much, Eduardo, for your masterclass in sherry aging. The information shared here, I'm sure, will help many people far and wide and is the next best thing to visiting the bodega. Please see below for Bodegas Tradición website and main social media handles. And while you're at it, why not head to interpretingwine.com slash sherry to subscribe and to catch up on any episodes that you've missed so far. Next time in the Sherry Week series, in episode 329, I speak to Eduardo Ojeda of Equipos Navajos. See you then.